Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and we're in the studio today, as ever, with ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin. Steve, you and I were recently in conversation regarding the general threat landscape for 2019, and you listed four areas of greatest risk. Today is the last of our four-part series of conversations that more thoroughly explore each significant area of risk. And so today, we'll be discussing supply chain. Supply chains are a vital component of every organization's global business operations and the backbone of today's global economy. However, in the supply chain, a range of valuable and sensitive information is necessarily shared with suppliers and thus direct control is lost. Because of the increasing supply chain threat in the coming year, I know, Steve, that you'll agree that organizations have got to come to terms with the fact that assuring security of the supply chain is, frankly, a lost cause. And instead, they'll have to focus on managing their key data and understanding where and how it has been shared across multiple channels and across boundaries, irrespective of supply chain provider. So, Steve, start us off. Tell us about the threat of the supply chain. Give us some background about the risks that are inherent. Yeah, and I think the the first thing I'd say about this one, Tavia, is that uh, whereas with a number of the other threats that we've talked about, people will, will hopefully be sitting there nodding and so on. This one is a little bit contentious because clearly a lot of effort, as, as you've pointed out in the introduction there, has gone into trying to ensure supply chain integrity, mm-hmm. uh, ensure the... Uh, robustness of of the processes that are in place across the supply chain. But the reality is that a significant proportion of the breaches that we continue to see come through the supply chain, through third parties. And so obviously something isn't working. Uh, And I think in this particular area, what what I'm actually saying is that we've probably reached the point where we need to review what we're doing. Mm. If we look at a typical supply chain assurance process, today, then organizations will be categorizing their suppliers. You'll put them into different categories of of importance. Um, Sometimes that's based on procurement value. Um, Hopefully, a lot of organizations have moved away from that now, but it's still prevalent. It's still out there and and moved away, I would hope, to the value of the actual asset that is being shared. That doesn't necessarily have the same monetary value as a procurement uh, view of it, by the way. And so organizations have tended to, as I say, categorize their suppliers and then impose a degree of compliance requirement, if I could put it that way, based on the category of supplier that you might be. And if you happen to be, say, a category one supplier, you may get a regular on-site audit to ensure that your Mm -hmm. security is in place. If you're a category two or a category three, that's more likely to be something like a self-produced audit. So you'll be sent a form or more likely you'll do it online and you'll complete a certain amount of questions so that at least there is a paper trail that shows that we've done our due diligence. But if you happen to fit into that sort of category four or five or or even even less, it's quite possible that you won't have any form of uh, security check being mm-hmm. carried out at all. And therein lies some of the challenge. So we do have limited resource. We don't necessarily have the time or the skills available to conduct the number of audits that we have to on an ongoing basis. So that's your category one that's now started to come into, into question. We also know that a lot of organizations will complete a questionnaire Uh, giving you some of the answers that they know that you want to see. That's not a very popular uh, position to take because people will be sitting there saying, of course, we don't do that. The reality is that we know that that happens. So again, this is another area where perhaps the integrity of the supply chain comes into question. And if you're not asking people any questions at all, then, you know, anything could be happening out there. And the challenge around all of that and why we've been doing it that way is that's a traditional approach to looking at your overall supply chain process. And at the ISF, we produce things like, you know, supply chain uh, assurance framework. We've produced the information risk assessment process. So lots of different tools, methodologies exist out there for really addressing these much more traditional approaches. But something has to change. Because our supply chains are becoming very much more complex, very much more interconnected. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible for us to ensure the data integrity, if we continue to adopt that approach. So What I think I'm saying in this particular section is let's actually face up to the fact that it is inefficient, Mm -hmm. that it isn't working as well as it might. And let's take a step back if we can and focus better on the value of the data that we need to be sharing on the assets. And let's take that into 
an overall account as to who needs to be accessing that information and who we need to be sharing it with. And I've mentioned before the relevance of the ISF approach, you know, protecting the crown jewels in this particular area. But I think that it does have a huge amount of relevance here, um, particularly when you link it up with our risk assessment methodology, IRM2, which really does does identify some of those business risks and, and the threats and vulnerabilities to data. And so what I'm advocating in 2019 is that organizations take a fresh approach, mm. that they take a much more data-centric approach, where they identify the critical assets They understand the importance of those assets to their business. And they understand who necessarily needs to be accessing those assets. And then they extend that outside the corporate environment into the supply chain, applying the same rigor Mm. to the asset as it moves around the different levels of supply chain around the world. And if we're thinking of somebody who works, say, in an R&D environment, that would probably be a blueprint for a new product. So, you know, if you follow that through, it probably starts out its life in a lab somewhere, perhaps, very restricted in terms of the number of people that are looking at it. Then it reaches a prototype level. You expand the sort of people who might be involved with it. You may involve at that point some some external support. Well, they then understand the importance of that prototype. And then you move into to some form of manufacturing where, again, you're sharing a blueprint. But you want to make sure that the integrity of that blueprint is preserved right the way across. And for some organizations, of course, they'll be sitting there thinking, well, we do that already. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's great. But there are a large number of organizations that still aren't, particularly if you happen to be a small to mid-sized enterprise. You're probably not following through that process. And so the benefit of looking at it from an asset perspective is that you can specify to your small to mid-sized suppliers, for instance, exactly what level of security you're expecting to see around that asset. It's very much easier for somebody to focus on a specific amount of data or a specific asset rather than it is across the whole process. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is where some of the potential for improvement lies. I'm not saying throw out all of the the, the ways in which you've been doing it in the past. But what I am saying is that there is probably a better way of securing some of those assets that you necessarily need to share that have very high criticality to your business. And that's what I would encourage businesses to be doing, um, certainly in 2019. Mm. It seems logical to me that with so many ways for supply chains to become insecure, there might be a resulting loss in confidence in the supply chain. Do you think that it's important that organizations turn inwards to minimize the threat of attacks? Is it better or necessary for an enterprise to create their own blend of in-house systems and capabilities rather than collaborating with outside vendors? I think that most organizations today are always going to have to deal with outside vendors. Hmm. I, I don't think there are many enterprises in public or private sector that have the ability to provide that total end-to-end service mm-hmm. because you don't necessarily have all of the skills that are required to do it. So you're, you're necessarily going to have to rely on other people. Uh, I look at this very often from a workforce standpoint you know if you're if you're thinking about what is what does the workforce of the future look like for an organization you're probably going to have three different categories of people you're going to have your full-time employees that are doing specific tasks within the organization that you've determined you need to keep in-house you're probably going to have some external providers managed service for instance you might decide that you're going to have um, cloud providers to store your data or you might have outsourced your security operations center for instance well those are going to be third-party vendors that need to understand the different levels of security that you you have Mm. as a requirement. And then you're going to have the third block of individuals who are probably going to be coming in and doing jobs for you on an ad hoc basis. Mm -hmm. It may be that they have very, very specialist skills. They, They could be pen testers, for instance, or they may be heating system engineers, but you're not having them on site every single day. They're there on an occasional basis. And again, you also need to understand the level of security that you need to be putting in place around that. If you adopt a sort of traditional approach to security across all of those different areas, we start to see some of the challenges that we've seen. Target, for instance, uh, with the the HVAC provider that that was the conduit Mm. um, into the operation. Um, As I said before, an increase in general breaches that are taking place via third parties. But if you're focusing very much more on the assets, you begin to worry about whether or not those critical assets need to be accessed by 
your air conditioning provider or mm -hmm. your heating provider? Or, or are they ring fenced? You know, are they kept entirely away from even your managed service provider? In certain instances, they might be. And so within that context, you have more control over the way in which you are securing the individual asset or intellectual property or whatever it might be that's important to you as a business. You can modify that in line with your risk appetite, which will change over time mm -hmm. uh, and indeed probably will change depending on which um, geography you happen to be operating in. So if you're operating across multiple boundaries, you know, it's quite, uh, it's quite possible that you would have a different level uh, of requirement in, in some countries from, from others. But again, your focus is very much more on the asset rather than the environment in which the asset is, is operating. That comes into account, but your risk profiling uh, and your, your risk assessment is conducted on the level of risk associated with losing that particular element of critical information mm -hmm. because you know the impact that that will have on your, uh, your organisation. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned some frameworks that the ISF uses, supply chain assurance framework and the supply chain information risk assessment process. These tools are widely used. What can organizations do to leverage such tools to adequately respond to increasing vulnerabilities? Yeah, I think it's about understanding, as I said before, Tavia, the overall environment in which you're operating. So you, you refer to two there that, that are particularly targeted at the supply chain from within the ISF. And what they try to do is to give you an overall insight into the sorts of framework that you should be potentially adopting uh, and indeed to give you some guidelines around the process that you should be following to ensure risk across that uh, supply chain environment. And of course, that's all related back to our standard of good practice, which is linked in then to different standards and so on. And you can map that across to ISO standards, NIST, cybersecurity framework and, and variety of different others, PCI included. And so I think that what, what those sorts of frameworks and tools do is two things. It, it gives you that overall reassurance that you are actually considering all of the different elements and all of the different components that you need to be considering, whether it be because you want to have, you know, ensure that you're compliant with ISO or wh mm -hmm. whatever it is. So it, it allows you to do that. The second thing that it does is it produces some form of standardization across the organization that you can then share with other third parties, particularly if you want to zero in on some of those critical assets that we've just been talking about. So, you know, these aren't the only tools that are out there in the industry. They happen to be the ones that uh, the ISF has produced and that our, our members tend to make use of. Um, but there are others out there. I think the important thing is that you have some form of process that you're comfortable with that caters for the way in which you're running your business and that allows you to be able to demonstrate that, that you have actually thought through the different uh, the different areas mm -hmm. where data may be traveling and yet you understand what the risks associated with it are and you've put in place some, some mitigating circumstances or some training programs or communication programs to really uh, address some of the challenges that are out there. Hmm. I know that after our conversation, listeners will begin to refocus on the traditional confidentiality and integrity components of the information security mix, which does unfortunately place an additional burden on already overstretched security departments. However, it's clear that businesses that continue to use a traditional approach to assure supply chain security, relying on tactics such as self-certified audit and assurance, may preserve the illusion of security in the short term, but will soon discover that the security foundations they believed to be in place were actually seriously lacking. That's why it's so important for enterprises to reassess the way they're managing their supply chains and ensure that their critical assets are being protected. We've reviewed each area of greatest threat in our special four-part series, and each does pose a potentially damaging threat or constellation of threats. But fortunately, even though the threat is serious, we know that businesses of every size are not on their own in addressing the challenges. Despite increasing risk, corporations that adopt and implement best practices can withstand attack and continue to thrive, creating value for their shareholders, employees, partners, and customers. Steve, I really appreciate you coming back and walking us through each of these four areas of threat. And I look forward, as always, to our next conversation.